My name is Rod Smola, and I am the president of the Vermont Law and Graduate School, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's Martin Luther King program. I'm looking forward to listening and learning from our fine panel of jurists and moderator about strategies for diversity, equity, and inclusion here in Vermont. But I'd like to begin with a reflection on a particular document authored by Martin Luther King that has had a profound influence on my own life as a lawyer and an educator. In April 1963, Dr. King and other civil rights leaders were leading the campaign in Birmingham, Alabama. And the culmination of that campaign was a march scheduled for Good Friday. An Alabama state judge, however, issued an injunction prohibiting Dr. King and other civil rights leaders from staging the planned Good Friday march. In an act of civil disobedience, Dr. King and others went forward with the march. And in front of national television, he was arrested and sent to the Birmingham jail. He spent several days in the jail, and while there, on scraps of paper, he authored one of the greatest documents in human history, probably the most powerful document ever written by any political prisoner, known to us today as the letter from a Birmingham jail. I'd like to share with you a few of the thoughts from that letter. It has had a profound influence on me. I reread it all the time, and I commend it to all students here. He first reflected on the interconnectedness of all of us. And in one of his most famous passages, he wrote, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned with what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of history. As we sit here in South Royalton today, let us remember that inescapable mutuality. Our concerns extend beyond Vermont. They extend beyond New England. They extend to Florida and to Texas and to Minnesota and to California. They extend to Kiev and Brasilia and Tehran. Second, I commend to you Dr. King's thoughtful approach to reform. He thought of reform as proceeding in four steps. He said, in any nonviolent campaign, there are four steps, collection of the facts to see what injustices exist, negotiation, self-purification, and direct action. I don't say to you that those are the magic four steps to be undertaken in Vermont. But I do commend to you that this great civil rights leader and reformer had a plan and had a strategic vision. Finally, I commend to you his realism, his understanding, as he wrote, that it is an historical fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. Individuals may see the moral light and voluntarily give up their posture, but as Reinhold Niebuhr has reminded us, groups tend to be more immoral than individuals. And although Dr. King was a preacher and a cleric and a civil rights activist, he knew the law. And jurisprudence, philosophy of law, was central to his theories of reform. Most importantly, he knew the difference between a just law and an unjust law. And he knew the difference between the formal law on the books, which can look pretty and egalitarian and fair, and the actual way that law is applied on the street. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you here today. And now I invite you to stand as we collectively sing 
the African American national anthem, let every vo lift every voice and sing. <laughs> Well, I think Rod grabbed my uh, my uh, little prompt that I had that I was going to read, so he must have took it with his. 
Um, so I just want to welcome you all here today. My name is Lisa Ryan. I am the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion here at Vermont Law and Graduate School. We are so excited to have you all with us today, and we're really excited to engage in a panel discussion with some of our very esteemed guests that we have with us today. Before I introduce our guests, I just want to let you know that immediately following our, um, our panel discussion, we will be having a question and answer session. So there are some note cards underneath your seats or close to with pens. So if you have questions throughout the discussion that you wanna ask our panelists, please write them down and then our student ambassadors will be coming around to collect those. Um, so I am so happy to welcome uh, our moderator for today, the Vermont Director of Racial Equity, Susanna Davis. Our guest panelists, we have Chief Justice Paul Ryber of the Vermont Supreme Court, Associate Justice William Cohen of the Vermont Supreme Court, Associate Justice Nancy Waples, the Vermont Supreme Court, and Chief Superior Judge Thomas Zone, the Vermont Superior Court. So without further ado, please enjoy, uh, join me in giving a warm welcome to our guests. Buenas tardes. Oh, thank you. Feels so good when you say it back. While our guests get set up, uh, I want to thank you all again for holding this event, for having us. Um, as you know, as Lisa already said, there are note cards positioned uh, around the room for questions. If you find that you need one, again, flag down an ambassador. Um, they can help you. Also, if you are joining us online, feel free to share uh, questions in Teams, and we'll have someone monitoring the chat during the Q&A period. I'm going to thank our panelists for being here and thank them in advance for joining me in speaking slowly and clearly for the transcript and making sure they're speaking into the mics so that our friends online can hear as well. All right. Well, listen, there's a lot to say. There's a whole lot to say and not enough time. We're here uh, on the Tuesday following the Memorial Day for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. There's a lot to say and a lot to do about racial justice in the United States and in Vermont. And the topics that we're going to talk about may be wide ranging today. Sure, we'll talk about criminal justice. It's a fan favorite when we talk about racial equity. But it's not alone, right? It exists alongside disparities in housing, education, employment, social, socioeconomic status. So we're going to have a very broad and wide-ranging conversation today, but it would be helpful for us to frame the discussion a little bit. We have uh, judges, justices from our state, and so I'd like to start with an area that's a little bit closer to their area of expertise. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the disparities that we've seen in the criminal justice sector. Uh, we have a little bit of data that we'd like to show you to help frame the discussion. We're going to cue that up right now. So what you're currently looking at is a slide that discusses uh, the working group that has been formed uh, with the Vermont State Judiciary. This is a working group that was formed in November of 2021. Uh, and what it did was review the results of sentencing analyses, specifically with race disaggregated data, I want to tell you a little bit about some of the results. I'm going to read them out loud just in case any of you are having trouble reading the screen. First, what was discovered was that in Vermont, black American people are six times more likely to be incarcerated than white people. We learned that there are disparities in the cases that are brought before the courts. For example, black American people in Vermont are more than 14 times as likely to be a defendant in a felony drug case in the state. 
We learned that black American people, once they are in front of the courts, they're not more likely to be convicted for most offenses or sentenced to longer incarceration terms, but there are still significant racial disparities between who does and who does not get incarcerated at all. We have a little bit more data for you, this time with more colors. Part of this working group's work also surfaced the following information. We learned through the expanded data collection from the Department of Correction that the total incarcerated population by race and ethnicity, once we started counting Hispanic as a thing that exists in the world, we learned that actually what we thought about the composition of Vermont's carceral facilities was a little bit different than we imagined. You'll see that in October of 2021, while white people in Vermont represented more than uh, 90 or 89-ish percent of the population overall, they represented about 86% of the prison pop of the incarcerated population in Vermont. Or I should say the population of people incarcerated by Vermont, because not everyone incarcerated by the state is held in the state. We also learned that in that same month and year, that by ethnicity, black people represented 9% of the incarcerated population, despite representing a significantly smaller percent of the overall population. And people who were identified as Hispanic or Latino represented 11% of the incarcerated population in the state. I can assure you we're not 11% of the total population. So sitting with these figures a little bit, no, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> you gotta show the microphone who's boss. <laughs> so with, with these data as a backdrop, I'd like to just go down the line and ask our panelists for a very basic and quick first reaction to these data. I know a number of you had already been privy to this information while the working group was going, but as we think about it in its collective, maybe each of you could just take a quick minute to tell us about what is the first thing that comes to mind when you see data like these. And I'll actually start uh, on, on this end with the Chief Justice. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Susanna, and thank you, uh, Vermont Law School, for hosting this event. This is uh, the fourth or fifth uh, MLK Day event I've attended, and, and they all are spectacular in their own way, and I am uh, very glad to be here. Uh, you know, I was uh, involved with the project uh, w that the statistics came out of, and I was... Um, uh, you know, I suppose one word for it would be disappointed when I read uh, the, the uh, results of what the Council of State Governments came up with when they looked at, uh, at the numbers. One of the, uh, so I am, I don't want to uh, go off on a tangent, uh, Suzanne, I'll try to follow your wishes uh, and keep this short, but um, disappointed uh, and uh, frankly, a little bit shocked. Uh, you know, one of the reasons that we are doing the project that uh, the four of us here in front of you are involved with, that the court signed off on um, over a year ago, is to shine a light on uh, the issue. This, this is a fundamental necessity that we have to bring to the table. We've got, that's one of the reasons that we're here today. That's one of the reasons that we were uh, very glad that uh, Lisa suggested that uh, we convene this panel for all of you. Uh, we need to be talking about this problem and this issue. I don't have uh, an easy answer uh, for why it is uh, uh, that we see these numbers, but uh, I'm concerned. Thanks, Chief. Justice Cohen. I think the, the words that come to my mind are that these numbers are unacceptable and bewildering. Um, unacceptable because there shouldn't be these types of discrepancies and bewildering because I'm not sure how it ever occurred that way. Um, we were, the three of us, um, Justice Wakels, myself, and Judge Zone, we're all trial judges. We've done plenty of jury trials, plenty of proceedings where discretionary proceedings it's it, it just the fact that it's come out as it has 
uh, it's, it's, it's not the system that I thought I worked in. And, uh, and that's the bewildering part, how we got there. So those are the words that I would use. Uh, thank you, Susanna. So uh, my name is Nancy Waples. And unfortunately or fortunately, I began my career in the um, early, early 80s with the uh, endemic, is that the word? The, endem the pandemic of crack cocaine. So crack cocaine at that time um, received a disparate sentencing um, based on the offense. Uh, it is a derivative of cocaine. And when white people were charged with possession of cocaine and usage or distribution, um, the sentencing was far more disparate than the crack cocaine that was commonly uh, consumed mostly by minorities, particularly black people. And the disparity in sentencing, um, most recently it's now been one to one, but prior to that for a long time, it was 18 to one. I recall when I was first prosecuting, it was a, some staggering number like 500 to one. I think it's a reflection of the systemic racism that victimized black people more and had them incarcerated at higher rates, um, ostensibly for possessing and consuming uh, the same vice. So uh, I think now we're living in the reality of that. And with that disparity in sentencing, of course, comes the disparate treatment of people of color when it comes particularly to drug offenses. So when I saw this information, the first question that came to my mind was, why? The next question that came to my mind is, what can we do to fix it? And the third question was, what am I going to do to try to address it? And I would note that it's precisely the answer to that final question that we have the commission, we have the steps that we are taking, because as Justice Cohen points out, when you look at these numbers, it's not the, what you would expect as a judge. It's not what you think the system looks like. And we need to critically assess it, and critically assess ourselves, for that matter, to make the decisions that are going to give us what we need in our justice system for everyone. Thank you. Judge Zone, you mentioned the commission, and I'd love to stay with you and just ask you if you could give the audience a brief uh, synopsis of what commission that is and what its purpose is. I would actually like to defer that to the chair of the commission, Chief Justice Ryber. Chief Justice, please go for it. The, uh, you should always know when to defer. <laughs> Law students always, learn that lesson. Always defer to the chief. You can't go I, on. You know, that's why I overruled you on a number of occasions. <laughs> Oh, no, I wasn't supposed to say that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the purpose of the, of the commission, broadly speaking, is to dig into these numbers. And we formed uh, three committees uh, as part of it. And the chair of each of those committees, uh, the chairs of each of those committees are before you. Justice Waples uh, chairs essentially the committee that's looking at policy. Uh, looking at how we run the courts. Uh, Justice uh, Cohen is chairing uh, the committee that's looking at data. Data is a huge problem for us. Uh, data for the state uh, on, on issues of uh, race uh, and ethnicity is a huge problem. Uh, that is to say that there's, there's really, uh, there are huge gaps in what it is that's being collected. Uh, and I chair uh, an outreach committee. The outreach uh, that we are doing is similar to this uh, experience that we're all uh, having this afternoon. Uh, in fact, on uh, Thursday afternoon, we're sitting, sitting, we're, we're, <laughs> we're holding a uh, open uh, forum in Bennington, at the courthouse in Bennington. We've invited very broadly uh, people from across the spectrum, different uh, uh, advocacy groups, if you will. Uh, we've advertised uh, the effort to ask people to come in and talk to us about their experience uh, in the courts, uh, what it is that they have found uh, with respect to 
um, any evidence that uh, they might bring to the table of bias uh, of, of any kind uh, in all of the processes that are followed uh, through the court system, mindful uh, that the process is not only a process that is executed by the judge who sits behind the bench, but it's a process that in the first instance uh, is undertaken by uh, the uh, law enforcement officers. It's a process in the second instance that's undertaken by a prosecutor uh, and then also by a defense attorney uh, and others who are involved in the system. We have a very uh, complex uh, and involved uh, system of justice in the state. So one of the reasons that we need to be out in public talking about this problem uh, is not only to shine a light on it, as I said uh, a few minutes ago, but it also is to uh, look to engage the public in an, in an understanding of what it is the courts stand for, how it is the courts uh, operate in our local communities, what it is uh, that we mean by uh, access to justice, uh, the rule of law, uh, equal justice under the law, what it is that we mean by that and how it is that it's important uh, to the fabric of uh, our communities uh, and our lives as uh, members uh, uh, jointly uh, of those communities. So it, this is a commission, uh, and by the way, I want to make one more point, Susanna. We uh, are moving forward with a commission that has got the imprimatur of every justice on the Supreme Court. The entire Supreme Court got behind this effort uh, when we saw the numbers that came out of the uh, Council of State Governments effort. This was through a charge and designation that we executed, as Susanna said, about, uh, well, a little over a year ago. Uh, and uh, we did so uh, because of the entire court's intent uh, to bring uh, into a focus um, uh, the problem that we're talking about here today uh, and to look for uh, solutions to that problem. Recommendations will be coming out of this commission uh, at the end of its work. Uh, recommendations back to the court uh, for uh, potentially for changes in process, changes in rules, and even it's possible that we'd make recommendations to the legislature about changes, changes in the law. Uh, so it's a very, um, um, it's a very uh, hopeful uh, effort that we're making, and uh, uh, I'm glad to talk some more about it, too. Thank you. Yep. Chief Justice, you, you talked about shining a light. Yeah. You talked about the phrase you just used was bring into focus, right? And I'm, I note that both of your metaphors really speak to the, the, the question of visibility. One of the reasons that we're able to discuss data around, as an example, Hispanic or Latino representation uh, in Vermont now is because of the change in starting to collect those data, starting to make the population visible where before it had not been. I wonder, Justice Cohen, can you talk a little bit more about the role that data plays in enacting changes to culture or, or practices? can, and the data information is, seems to be much more difficult than we had envisioned. We do have a paperless system now called Odyssey. Odyssey can track both race and ethnicity, uh, but how you get that information and how that information gets programmed in Odyssey, there's no necessary consistency. So you've got two methods of getting information on race and ethnicity. One would be self-reporting, asking somebody what their race is or what, how, how one person identifies within that ethnic group or not. Or observational. Um, and we'll say, for example, a police officer pulls somebody over who is black and just checks off black on there. It doesn't, it's not required to be in this Odyssey system. We don't know how it actually gets there um, because it goes to the central system. So we need, to, we need to figure out appropriate systems to gather it. And that would mean either from observational information, self-reported information, or there's a significant group uh, that feel very uncomfortable giving that information out. 
we want to know that as well. So um, in many areas where there's significant distrust of institutions, um, and I use Native Americans, for example, uh, when asked, they're not going to give that information out. And the reason they, it's not given out is because they think that they're not going to have um, equal treatment in, in the court system, so equal access to the court system. And that's a significant problem in my mind. Um, but it's also something that we need to, we need to know and we need to follow. Uh, and when people distrust the, the institutions and, they, um, and don't think that the institution is going to give them a fair break, uh, that's another part of this that we need to work on. And if you look at it, I'll just be the last thing I say on it. Um, we, this is the second whitest state in the country behind Maine. And if you're black and you go into a courtroom, you're going to walk into that courtroom, you're going to see pictures of old white guys on the wall. You're going to walk in, you're going to see a white judge, except for maybe Justice Waples, the only judge we have of color on, in the court. You're going to see white prosecutors, you're going to see white um, public defenders, and, when, and you're going to see an all white jury. And I, I seen, I've seen juries be very, very gracious to people of color in verdicts, but from the person's mind walking in there, it'd be really difficult to not have a sense that this is, that this is, that this system is not for them. Uh, and that's another area I think we need some significant work on. Thank you. Justice Cohen, your, your comment reminds, uh, reminds me of something that Justice Waple said earlier when talking about um, the sentencing disparities between rock and powder cocaine uh, and Justice Waples, the exact words you said were, we're now living in the reality of that, yeah. right? The downstream impacts uh, afterwards. So Justice Cohen, it sounds like based on the state and the country's history with indigenous communities, we're now living in the reality of having trouble with data collection, particularly with communities like the indigenous community because of self-reporting and distrust. I was just using the ind indigenous community, but yeah. I think it's across the board for any uh, for any users. Um, yeah, and it could even be it could even be economic. A person walks in without uh, significant resources. So, you also talked about um, self-reported versus perceived, and about people feeling willing and trustful enough to identify as being part of a certain demographic group. Um, and I think part of Part of being able to self-identify or part of thinking the system is for you, I think as you said, requires some level of individual empowerment, right? That you feel like you can engage with the system at least a little bit on your terms. Right. I know this is probably not a, a, an easy on the spot question, but um, Judge, uh, Judge Sone, I wonder, do you have any thoughts or examples of ways that the courts can help individuals feel more empowered or more visible or interact with the system in a way that feels like it's for them? Well, I don't know that we'll ever make that black man who walks into the Vermont court that Justice Cohen describes and sees all white people feel that this is my court. But I think we can and must let them know that you're part of our court. We are part of your life. You are part of our, we are all in this together. One of the things that always strikes me is you'll have a judge who says, you know, because sometimes you'll have a defendant, let's say it's a black man who comes in from out of state, he's picked up for, for selling drugs, which is right. We see a lot of that uh, statistically. And you know, we, we say, well, you know, calm down. I know how you feel and I'm going to treat you fair. Really? How many people of color in this room would feel comfortable? Oh, that white, bald old judge is telling me he's going to treat me fair. Everything's going to be OK. And so I think one of the things we in the bench need to do is make sure that we explain to the men and women who come before us, uh, we are going to do our job. We're going to treat you fairly and appropriately. And we're going to do it in a way that respects you like everyone else. It was in 1789, George Washington said that the due administration of justice is the firmest pillar of good government. Color didn't matter when you do your job in our courts. It, it can't matter. Uh, we have to do 
our job and treat that individual the way that they need to be treated. And you know, I think really it's, it's, it's talking to them, being responsive to them, reading someone's body language. If you can see someone's getting upset by something you're saying, well, maybe it's time to change what you're saying or say it in a different way. And we as judges have that ability to help people. And take a, as a judge, practically speaking, you take a break. If I see someone getting upset, you know, Mr. Jones, we'll take a break for a few minutes, let you talk to your attorney, okay? Things like that. I just think it's, it's an understanding that we have to have. And, and you, you talk about the individuals, but on the more global perspective, uh, it's, it's training as judges. We spend quite a bit of time looking at ourselves, implicit bias, explicit bias. How can we positively affect those coming into the courts? And it's an everyday learning process. And as the chief points out, that's what our commission is trying to accomplish, learning and, and being able to make those changes. And Susanna, one thing that the judiciary <clears throat> initiated prior to establishment of the Commission on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion is to start a program of um, ling uh, a language access program. Uh, it was a committee that was created within the judiciary. It was, I was on, a member of that committee. It is dear to my heart because English is a learned language for me. And we created a committee uh, because we do have so many foreign speaking uh, residents here through our resettlement program, which is a great program. Um, but we translated uh, court forms into 15 different languages, making it um, uh, accessible to those who don't speak English as a first language. And of course, the law doesn't mean anything if you can't access it. So that is a vital concern of this judiciary and we've worked hard to make that happen and we're still continuing to work on that. Absolutely. So <clears throat> thank you for that, Justice Waples. Actually, um, one of the comments you made ties back to something also that, that Judge, Zone, Judge Zone said. Judge Zone, you talked about um, something simple like taking a break when you see a party uh, maybe distraught, upset, disoriented, or what have you, which I think speaks to some of the more human services side of um, service providing, right? The being trauma-informed, understanding when a person is upset and understanding social psychology and whether that person is in a mindset to be effective at communicating or learning, right? Are you high in your amygdala in your fight or flight response or are you here and present and understanding what's happening. And I think that that also speaks to what Justice Waples talked about with the resettlement program. Yes, we understand that language access is important for anyone who may be an immigrant in general, but in particular, if you come here under refugee status, maybe you already have a background that you may have had greater traumatic, traumatic experiences. What is your experience like in the courts? And is it just relegated to the language or is it also that more human component of understanding, really meeting you where you are? I think those are, are both important points to uplift. I just want to let our audience know we are five minutes away from our Q&A period. So if you have questions you haven't jotted down yet, please be sure to do that. We will be starting with the questions that are being shared on Teams. So those of you who are watching virtually, if you have questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. Where are the three by five cards? I ask myself that at least twice a day. <laughs> We're gonna make sure some ambassadors come around with a few extra cards for you. Justice Waples, uh, I'd like to come back to you, actually. One of the things that we've been talking about a lot is the way in which members of the public feel like the courts belong to them right. and the ways in which we treat people who come to the courts. But as the chief pointed out earlier, it's also about the experience of those who are on the courts mm -hmm. and in the courts. Mm -hmm. And that most parties to a matter in Vermont, unless they're before you, they may not be before a judge of color. Right. Um, and I'm curious to know, to the extent that you're willing to share, how do you see the Vermont court system as advancing detracting or remaining inert with respect to equity on the bench? So, um, 
So it, I thought you told it not to do that, Susanna. <laughs> I have great faith in Susanna. So uh, I, am, I, I feel very privileged to be the first uh, judge appointed to the trial bench and the first justice appointed to the Supreme Court. And while I'm proud of that, I hope I am not the last. So I have on my own as a practitioner and as a trial judge and a justice uh, tried to uh, encourage people of color to uh, think of a career in the judiciary. Uh, when I first joined the VBA, I started the diversity section. Uh, for all of you here who think you want to practice in Vermont, I would encourage you to seek membership in the diversity uh, uh, section. It's very robust. It's uh, a high-functioning uh, committee, and I'm very proud of it. Um, I've tried to do the same in terms of recruiting or dis encouraging uh, attorneys of color to consider a career on the bench as well. Um, I, I find it especially in a rural state, that it's not um, uncommon that somebody walks into a courtroom and is surprised that I'm the person sitting there. And uh, my last name belies any ethnicity, and I think that further confuses people. Um, but I have, by and large, found that uh, because we are a state that um, respects its institutions, uh, I feel that way. I, I feel that it's not been um, uh, something that has been a uh, detriment when I am a member of the bench. I can say, and I think I've shared this before, that um, when I first started my comment saying that I kind of grew up in the um, uh, crack and uh, cocaine um, uh, uh, epidemic, I didn't mean to imply I was that young. I certainly don't look that young. I was a prosecutor in Manhattan at the time when uh, co crack cocaine was the um, major uh, narcotic that, uh, that was uh, sweeping New York City. Um, but I practiced law as a uh, prosecutor in, and a defense attorney in New York on both the state and federal courts, and probably have been practicing for close to, I don't know, maybe close to 20 years, maybe, maybe, uh, oh, maybe not that long, that's too long now, uh, but at le let's say at least for a while. And when I moved to Vermont, the first time I walked into a courtroom, it was in Chinden, and I looked at the um, calendar and saw, I was a criminal defense attorney, and I saw my client's name on the list and went into the courtroom to look for my attorney and not seeing the, uh, I mean, so to look for my client and not seeing my client, I entered the well where the court officer is seated and he usually has a master list and that list sometimes is not um, the same as what's posted. And I asked him for client X, whether he had checked in. And he said to me, oh, you're not allowed in the well. Only um, attorneys are allowed in the well. A client, uh, you're a defendant, so you can't be here. And I said, well, I'm, I'm not a defendant. And then he said, well, then you must be the translator, and you have to wait for the you have to wait for the um, prosecutor to show up before you can um, uh, address, the, uh, address me or the court. So um, I think as a practitioner, it was uh, different, and I can only imagine for a, a, um, a, a, a plaintiff or a defendant, it's, it's probably different. I think as a judge, um, I have not had the the experience of someone being shocked. I think they often are maybe surprised, but probably not shocked. That feels like we're talking about not just access to being delivered justice, but access to being able to deliver justice as a member of the profession. Yeah, yes, I agree. 
Mm. Thank you there for sharing a, there that. There is a significant movement in the judiciaries throughout the country of this notion of procedural fairness. You can, you can read about it on, your, on computers, um, but it is a method of judging that um, many people have adopted. Judge Zoni probably can talk about it more as it's applied in the trial courts. I, I actually have the pleasure of serving as the past chair of the National Judicial College Faculty Council. And we, not only in Vermont, but nationally, the topic of procedural justice is something that has been a focus over the past several years. Judge Dave Suntag is a retired judge from the state of Vermont. And Judge Suntag actually is one of the leading experts on teaching that, so we're fortunate to have him work with our judges here. But it's really a function of uh, how you treat, as you point out, people in court, making sure that the process is open, making sure the process is understandable, and making sure the process is fair. And this is an area that is uh, getting a lot more focus, as it should, because it's necessary to make sure everyone receives procedural justice. Thank you for that. So I'd like to turn it over to the audience. Um, let's begin with some of the team's questions. That's a lie. I'm going to begin with some of the in-person questions. Thank you very much. Mm. Mm. This one's tingly. Uh, I, I'm going to leave the question open to any panelists who'd like to comment. The question says, I'm hoping you can comment on the idea that we as a society, especially white people, have de-radicalized the efforts of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. to his detriment and to the detriment of us all. How can we highlight the radical efforts of MLK to further radical social change and justice going forward? I'm not going to answer the question, but I'll start with one thing, and that was um, listening to I Have a Dream speech today. And the message he was giving in 1963 on I Have a Dream is still, still so present in 2023, it's 60 years ago. And, um, and his issues involving poverty and discrimination and racism and all the rest are st things we still, we still are adjusting to and, and need to. So, but I'm not going to answer the question. That's I think better for the chief. Let me try. Uh, I think that the uh, uh, the issue that we're talking about of racism and bias uh, is such a complex uh, and difficult problem. It, I think it's difficult simply to talk about. I think it's very interesting to bring perspective to what Dr. King did. Um, as a, a radical effort. I don't think about his effort in those terms myself, but I also think uh, that the problem is as complex as it uh, stands to be, that it takes uh, many different voices from many different perspectives to engage in this sort of dialogue in order to come to a complete uh, and full embracing of the problem and uh, uh, potential solutions. Thank you. I have one that can, is, it's, I guess, probably a, a yes or no, a quick one. Um, so anyone who would like to answer may. The question is, is Vermont still holding persons incarcerated for cannabis possession and or sales in state prison? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, there could be someone serving a sentence for uh, the sale of marijuana that could have been uh, still criminalized, but I, I could actually, that's one of those things that in my job now, as I said early on, what can I do to try to find things out? Email the right person to get the data. I, and so we could possibly find that out and let you know. I do think that because the um, federal laws still have marijuana as a controlled substance, uh, and they do still prosecute uh, marijuana cases, a lot of defendants who are arrested and then detained uh, pending trial will uh, be incarcerated in uh, state facilities, 
administer or monitor by the Department of Corrections. So I think it's important to make a distinction between um, those defendants who are detained under federal jurisdiction and then those who are detained under um, state laws. That's an excellent point. And I can round out the last part of the, quest of the answer, which is there's nobody in Vermont right now being held solely on cannabis charges. If you were incarcerated originally for charges related to cannabis and something else, then you may still be held mainly because of the and something else. Mm -hmm. But as far as I'm aware, as far as I've been told, no one is incarcerated by the state of Vermont solely for cannabis offenses. Panelists, we received three questions um, that all boil down to how, if at all, are we incorporating rest <laughs> how, if at all, are we incorporating restorative justice practices into our court system? So I'm, let me take that question first, if uh, my colleagues don't mind, because I'm the newbie on the Supreme Court and the most recent um, person with uh, trial court experience on the bench, notwithstanding Judge Zone being chief administrative judge. I don't think you often uh, sit on the bench or on dockets unless you have to pinch it, right? Correct. Right. Pinch okay. It. Okay. So I have had the privilege of sitting on uh, eight of our four, on eight benches in our 14 counties um, in the course of six years. So I did a lot of traveling, and it was never a hardship because we live in the most beautiful state in the world. Um, but I did see a big disparity in terms of how uh, each county administers its restorative justice program, uh, depending in large part on the prosecutor and on um, the director of the program. Uh, I think restorative judge, justice is um, extraordinarily important. And I think as we go forward more as a society, and particularly a society that has compassion, and um, at the same time holding people accountable, there isn't any better um, vehicle than the restorative justice program. Of course, public safety is paramount, but the restorative justice program takes into um, consideration uh, the level of violence in um, an offense before it's referred over to the restorative justice so, uh, program. So I, I, th I don't think there is any uniformity, unfortunately, in the application of restorative justice um, based upon what I've seen in individual counties. Some counties will take a particular offense and divert it through restorative justice. Other counties will not. And, and certain police departments, local police departments or even the state police, have community policing officers whose job it is, is to, to divert from the get-go um, right. uh, individuals. So that's, um, that's something that's uh, being worked on. I know my hometown of Rutland, Rutland City, does have a community police officer who's that the sole responsibility is to look at cases. Thank you. So we are pretty much at time, um, but it is always tragic for me when questions do not at least get said out loud, even if they're not answered. So with your permission, I would at least like to read the remaining questions we have so that we as a group can take some of that away with us and continue our learning on them. Um, we had a question asking, what's the best way to increase representation of diverse backgrounds in the Vermont Bar? And I know we've talked a lot about race and ethnicity today, but um, when we talk about diversity and diverse backgrounds, we also would do well to consider socioeconomic status, gender, uh, gender identity, orientation, disability, et cetera. So that was one question about representation. What are the justices and the court staff doing to address unconscious racial bias? What advice would we give to a high school student who wants to work to create a more equitable state? What role should judicial discretion play in the legal process? Is there too much or too little in our system? 
Um, one person who notes or who wonders whether the dearth of data we have might be precisely because Vermont is a majority white state and asking how this issue compares with other states. To the asker of this question or anyone looking for demographic data, I would urge you to visit the VCGI website. It's the state of Vermont. It's the Vermont Center for Geographic Information. They did a lot of mapping around census data from the 2020 census, so you can get more insight into the numbers and how Vermont stacks up. Also, uh, census.gov is another good place. Uh, another writer asks, during the pandemic years, Vermont courts were closed or backed up. Many people who had been arrested and could not make bail were kept in jail for months, convicted of no crime. Um, and the presumed question here is, how does this match with our values on justice? Um, a breaking news, an asker has asked, um, has paused, has, I'm not sure if it's a question, but Vermont being mostly white by intention and the no, noting that past policies have created this present, which really goes back again to Judge Wa Justice Waples' quote about now we're living in the reality of that. We have uh, two more that have to do with demographic data. In particular, one asks, um, what substantive changes are we doing to address some of these issues? Because even though some data are lacking, we do know enough to get started doing something. And our last writer for the day asks us, how do other states address racial, uh, racial issues in the courts? How does Vermont's demographic composition compare to the rest of the Northeast? And are the majority of non-white people in Vermont black and Hispanic? What about indigenous and um, Asian people? And again, I would direct that person to some of our census figures and some of the analyses that we have done about them for more information about that. Um, Could I just make one comment, Susanna? Please. Please. Questions about what can we do, what can we possibly you know, assist with, things like that. We on the commission are having meetings across the state. There will be one in the area. So please pay, if you want to check on our, we have a website. Uh, I'm sure we'll have information, whether it's at Vermont Law School or other communities, to welcome you to please come to our forums. We might not have time to talk about your questions and concerns today, but there will be a time where we certainly will be able to do that. So please uh, let us have an information because what we get from you in the judiciary helps make your court, our court, uh, much stronger and better. Thank you, Judge. Can I, uh, may I answer the uh, high school question of a uh, young high school student who said, what can, what can I do, what can we do as high school students? Um, target a career in public service. Uh, think about uh, going to law school, uh, become a lawyer, uh, acquiring tools that are necessary under our uh, constitutional democracy in order to effectuate change. These tools are absolutely fundamental to how our processes work. It's very important uh, that we understand those processes, that we engage in the processes in a, uh, in a constructive way. Uh, so I would encourage you to set your sights on uh, something if not law school, something, something like law school, uh, and um, be glad to talk further with uh, high school students uh, about that objective at any time. All right. I have really enjoyed the panel um, presentation. I thank all of the panelists for being here. And before we send the group off, I just wanna do a quick summary of what we talked about and what we learned and what we surfaced. So the, the question presented on the flyer is, what does an equitable legal system look like in Vermont? And it sounds, based on the answers from our esteemed panelists, it sounds like what it looks like is bringing into focus, shining a light, not letting things continue to be unseen. It means that when people distrust institutions, we have to build trust. And that building that trust has to happen not just in technical, legalistic ways, but in human ways. Allowing ourselves a literal and a figurative breather. It means that while we're currently living in the reality of past harms, 
we still, as one of our writers said, we still know enough to act now on something. It means, as Judge Zone said, we are going to do our job. And of course, when we ask ourselves, who is the we? Well, the we could be any of us. The we could be Justice Waples. The we could be me. The we will ostensibly be many of you. So what does an equitable legal system look like in Vermont? I suppose the quick and easy answer is, it looks like you but not without hard effort. Thank you all so much for your time. Can I get the question? Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Lisa. Oh, before you guys go, <laughs> just, just one more second, please. <laughs> um, my name is Maya Young. I'm the president of the Black Law Students Association here, also known as BALSA. Um, I heard a woo. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you guys so much for the amazing conversation. I took away that an equitable system in Vermont looks like access, and I think Justice Wables, you talked about that. Um, and it also reminds me of someone mentioned the I Have a Dream speech that MOK did, and he talks about the triple evils, which is racism, militarism, and poverty, and that all kind of just sort of interacts with what an equitable system looks like in Vermont. So thank you guys so much for just sharing that with us, and thank you guys for the questions that you guys asked. They were wonderful. I wanted to ask something, but I knew that it was gonna be a lot. But um, this is an amazing, an amazing program. Thank you, Dean Ryan, for everything. And we have some, yes. <laughs> and we have some gifts for our presenters so you guys don't walk away empty handed. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe. Thank you. So as the as the director of Balsa, you oh. get to ask the question. I do. You do. Oh, oh my question. gosh, this is so great. Thank you. Um, well, my question, someone asked it already, was related to restorative justice, but I wanted to know what you guys thought just about the history of America and how sort of victimizing different marginalized groups have been, if RJ would be an effective sort of um, answer to that problem, or do you think that the current justice system model as us going before a jury of our peers and a justice system advocating for those on their behalf is the best way? Wow. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's a tough one. I know. That's why I didn't want to ask it. I, it was no, no, no. But it's a legitimate question. And, um, and I was a trial judge for 20 years before I went on the Supreme Court. And one of the more difficult things was when you had a black defendant, how you ask the white jurors questions involving their perceptions of somebody of color. And I've seen jurors get really angry because they, that's not part of the way they think, that's not part of the way they are. Um, but it has, to be, it has to be raised. And you think about yourself, if you're, if you're a lawyer and you're in front of jurors, do you bring it up? How do you bring it up? How do you bring it up in a way that's not gonna be um, uh, in the least bit offensive? But I, I've, I have to say that um, Vermont jurors, in my experience, doing many jury trials, really are colorblind. I mean, it's, it's easy for me to say, as a, as, um, but there's a lot of not guilty verdicts uh, in cases. Um, and so I have such faith in Vermonters and such faith in Vermont jurors doing the right thing and not being caught up in the way a person looks. Does that reassuring to a defendant who's sitting there? I don't think so, but it is reassuring to me. I'm watching many years of, of jury trials. So my experience, <clears throat> excuse me, is deeply personal. Um, I have great faith in our institution, in the judiciary. I, as an immigrant, 
Uh, I have great faith in all the institutions of our country. Ha notwithstanding the fact that we are a nation of immigrants, immigration is what we do best in comparison to the rest of the world. Ironically, we're also a nation that excludes and subjugates a lot of those immigrants who came. So I have found that the best response to protect yourself and what you stand for is a career in the law because it will, it will prepare you for what is necessary to defend yourself. My first experience with the law was as a child, and we lived in public housing, and my parents spoke no English, and they were facing eviction. And I felt enormously helpless because I, all I could do was help translate. I didn't understand the law and what I could do to save our home. When I became an American citizen, it was one of the proudest moments of my life because I knew then that I could use the law to protect myself and all those others who needed protection. And that, to me, has been an extraordinary, extraordinarily fulfilling career. So I commend all of you for taking this avenue going forward. I don't know if I've answered your question. But sort of, yeah, sort of similar. It goes back to what you said earlier about mm -hmm. what good is the law. I'm paraphrasing a bit, but what good is the right. law if you don't understand it? And so, right. sort of, sort of um, going to law school and understanding it helps you to know how to use it to defend yourself and others. Most importantly, help others. If, if I understood your question. <laughs> One component of your question was it, the justice system being more of the jury trial, guilty or innocent, or the restorative justice. Mm -hmm. I think it has to be both. Mm -hmm. Because we need to treat people as individuals. And everyone's case is not a cookie cutter case. Everyone is not the same. And so a justice system that recognizes there is an appropriate time for restorative justice, and there is an appropriate time for the jury to make the decisions, is the, we need to strive for that. And sometimes the key is to figure out which cases go in which direction. The, um, the, the finest, one of the finest trial judges the state ever, has ever had is a judge named um, Frank Ma Ma uh, Mahady. And he's very famous if you were, you, are, you guys are way too young. So anyway, uh, <laughs> um, but he always said, every defendant is like a snowflake. They're all different. You just gotta look at, look at each one. And he would have this, he had this amazing ability to look at people and, um, and interact with people and engage them in a way. And you always knew when you're in front of Judge Mahady that, um, that it was gonna be, might not be the decision you like, but it would be a well thought out, reasoned, fair decision. And that's what we strive to do. Um, and uh, it's, it's, and there are plenty of trial judges out there now who, who do the same thing. Awesome. Thank you guys so much again. And thank you guys for answering my question. Thank you. <laughs> Closing to the program, we will have the song We Shall Overcome be sung by the faculty and staff of VLGS. Okay. Did you have no judgment? I did. Okay, if you all can grab your hands and crisscross, this is what we used to do in the olden days at the civil rights meeting. Can you all, okay, crisscross. We shall overcome, we shall Be 
shall overcome someday. We shall live in peace. We shall live in peace. We shall live in peace. We shall live in peace someday. Oh, deep in my heart, we do believe we shall live in peace someday. It doesn't matter. We shall overcome. One more time. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart. Thank you.